Hi, everybody. I'm your friend and host for Life and Finances with Sacrifice and Service, Anthony Burroughs. Now, tell me something. Have you ever heard a parent saying or parents saying to their child or their children, get a government job? And then they would go on to say, because government jobs are good jobs. And someone may ask, well, what makes it such a good job? And they would then follow that up and say, because after you finish working for the government, you have a pension for the rest of your life. I say, wow, no one's looking at salaries and all the other things. Just say, get that good government job. Now, you know, a government job, and when I say government job, I'm talking about the civil service as well as quasi entities that are part government and part um, corporation. And people look at them because they are what? Safe and secure. And there's this thing known as permanent and pensionable. Now that's self-explanatory in a way I should say. Permanent means that you have permanent status as an employee within the service. And pensionable means that you qualify to get a pension after your years of service. Now, we had a situation due to the pandemic. Approximately, it was estimated that 54,000 Bahamians weren't able to go to work for at least 9 to 10 months. That's, yes, about 10 months. Thing is, we had a lot of government employees, so more than 60% of them were still at home drawing their pay. And I guess that makes it a safe and secure job because persons would say, I want a government job so that because you don't get laid off and they don't fire you. And in some cases, he's saying they can't fire you. But we know that's contradictory and that's not really true. And persons often crowd their MPs looking for government jobs. Now, in the civil service and the quasi government, there are jobs for everybody at every station in life, from the street sweeper straight on down to the Supreme Court justices and everything in between. I guess you've guessed it. What I'm talking about today, no, it isn't about government job. It's about pensions. That's what I'm exploring and looking at today. Pensions, are they worth waiting for? Are they worth sacrificing for? Now, people normally accept jobs for various reasons. And many of the reasons are, oftentimes based on benefits, based on benefits. Now, benefits such as vacation, sick leave, Christmas bonus, salary, opportunities for travel, insurance, and then yes, pension. Now let's look what a pension is. A pension really and truly is a fund or a group of funds and things that you put money, in which a sum of money is paid into while you and I are working and then after, at the completion of our years of service, we then draw monies out as to support us once we have stopped working. And these are usually run through banks and insurance companies and things of the nature. Now, the employer that's most known for pensions, and yes, you get it, at the end of the employment service is our civil service or civil servants and the quasi-government entities. Now, our labor force is estimated to be around 170,000 persons. And on the last uh, um, household survey, it was at around 154,000, 157,000, which was about five, six years ago. Of that labor force, the civil service accounts for about 27,000 employees. And then other government entities, that's the other quasi-government entities and corporation, account for another 12,000, between 10 and 12,000 persons, totaling almost 40,000 employees who are drawing their pay from the public treasury on a monthly basis. And then the civil service salaries, when you look at civil servant salaries, there's chunk of the budget, the national budget, they account for 30% of the budget at 790 million, 941,410 dollars more than half a billion actually it's 200 about 300,000 over then if you take into um consideration the additional 10 to 12,000 persons who work in quasi entities 
That's another 200 million thrown on top of that. So you're looking at, at about 900, almost a billion dollars in salaries. But, you know, we're a nation, we don't um, encourage entrepreneurship and going it out there and pursuing and contributing and building the economy like that. So a lot of persons just run and grab a government job because in many instances, we have not properly equipped and educated the people to do that. Now, let's look at some salaries, entry-level salaries within the civil service. And you've had situations where parents would say, I know of two or three situations where parents have told their children, forget this college, drop out of college, University of Bahamas, and go and get uh, one of those government jobs. And sometimes, I guess, they'll make links and all of that and get it for them sometimes. And so places they like to send them, when they tell them drop out, uh, like, and the thing is, when you tell your child to drop out of college to go join these government entities, you're robbing them of millions of dollars of lifetime income. And that can make the world of difference over a lifetime. But anyhow, places they like to say, Royal Bahamas Defense Force as a recruit, and you earn about 21000 per annum. Royal Bahamas Police Force as a recruit, you earn about the same 21000 per annum. Prison recruit. You earn, at, while coming as a recruit, 20,000 per annum. After a nurse is done with training, she's at around 22,000 per annum. A fireman recruit, at about 20,500 per annum. A trained teacher, after she's completed training, at 23,300 per annum. And it causes me to remember a story someone told me. A friend of mine, he had a friend who... They went to college together, and after they both of them came home and graduated, one of the friends decided, hey, I want to be a teacher. He has a degree in math. And so he went and applied to Ministry of Education, and they said, well, hey, you're going to have to go and do a one-year or 18-month program, something like that, so you can learn how to actually teach the math. His thing was like, you know what? I ain't got time for that. So he jumped back on the plane, went back to Georgia, and here's what happened. The moment he set foot back down in Georgia... There was a, a, a wealthy private school, snapped him up, and you know what they did? They put him on an eight-week crash course in learning how to teach the subject that he's doing it. So you hear this, we're telling the young man, the man come on the plane, come back home, and we're telling him, hey, you got to take 80, a, a year to 18 months. When he got on back there, they said to him, hey, come, let's go. We can put you in an eight-week crash course because they know math teachers are not a dime a dozen, but it's about perspective and thinking outside of the box, not being in this fix and set thing, but that's how the civil service is designed. Everything is fit and set and one size fits all. Then probably the lowest salary in the civil service that they have with what is known as the general service worker. That person is not permanent and they're not pensionable. And they're usually, um, qualification level might be fairly low sometimes, but the general service worker, they're, when they come in, they're earning $9,600 per annum. And that is about $800 per month. Now, that's a, that's a disgrace. But I guess no one's putting a gun to the person head and making them accept the job. Now, let's look what some of the steps you have to take to qualify for a pension as a civil servant or quasi-government employee. Remember, this is for those who are permanent and pensionable. So... You must have 30 years of service, and that service must be unbroken. So if you were there for 30 years, and you had a year leave of absence, maybe study leave, or unpaid leave, or whatever you had to do, then that would be deducted from it, and so you wouldn't qualify for the pension if it doesn't total 30 years. So you want to make sure you get the 30 years. Now, if you have 30 years, and at the age of 55, you can take what is known as early retirement. Mandatory retirement in the civil service, of course, is 65. That's mandatory retirement. Now, in the QSI entities, the mandatory retirement is at 60. And you know, they have a higher salary. And according to actuary calculation, hey, at 60, you have to go. Then, as you look at the retirement and pension, now you remember, the Bible doesn't support retirement. And I'm looking at it from that perspective. What the Bible does, basically, is you then, as you age, you transition to other forms of work, other types of work that can match your physical ability as well as your mental capacity. And 
your ability to just um, get around and do things. Now, this notion of retirement started in Germany with a guy in 1889 with a guy of Otto von Bismarck. You can, uh, now, you can leave it up to the Germans. They're going to start something like that. But it has spread around the world. And before then, persons just continued to work and work until they died. And what happened too is that, therefore, you had younger persons couldn't come up and get jobs because the position was filled. So it was a way of rotating persons out. And then he started the notion of let's have pensions. Now, when you're looking at retirement, you have like the uniform branches, which are the police, defense force, and the prison. They can go after 25 years of service. And it's, it's not uncommon for a guy around his mid to early 40s to retire from, from those branches. Because if he goes in at 18 and puts in 25 years, he is around 43 years old. And now, when I look at then let's look at some example of some quasi government. We have like ZNS, the Mortgage Corporation, BPL, even though they are now 51% owned by foreign entity, BTC, same thing. Uh, University of the Bahamas, Bank of the Bahamas, Water and Sewage Corporation, the Gaming Board, Bahamas Air, Central Bank, BAIC, um, Development Bank, and then you have like Bamsi, and I'm sure there are, one, there are a couple others that I would have missed out. And you know what, when I look at this, I say, boy, there's a commonality here with all of these places along with the civil service. And someone will say, what's that? And to me, here it is, is the massive amount of complaints by the public of their poor service. And I can recall trying to get BPL to change on street light bulb through my neighborhood for at least three years and it still ain't done. I can remember trying with BTC, trying to get internet connection for a whole year, going in month after month, and still didn't happen until after the pandemic hit. Everybody had to work from home, and I guess um, everything is monitored then, so therefore they had, they had to do it. Now remember, the, the performance of the civil service has nothing, nothing I should say to do with us being black people or Bahamians. It's just something that's a worldwide phenomenon. Just about virtually every country, when you go into their civil service entity, you get bad and poor service in most cases. Now, I'll say two places stand out to me in our nation in terms of that's governmental that gives superb service and I've seen it match nowhere else. The first one is the passport office. Their service is, first of all, they digitize and all of that. I mean, it's just tremendous service, and I've dealt with them several times over the last couple of years, just dynamic service. And then the other one is the road traffic department, especially during the pandemic, but prior to that, their service have always been good. Now, we know in the, in the old days, the service was shabby, but man, these two entities have really stepped it up. And I guess part of it has to do, too, in the old days, um, civil servants really, I mean, it was just a higher standard and higher caliber of workers that, were, that, that came in. And I guess there were less opportunities in those days. So the brighter and the smarter and the persons who have options no longer come to the civil service because they have other options. Now, one set of countries that I've observed I shouldn't say I've observed that I've read about that give excellent civil servant um, service to the public, uh, some of the Asian countries. But I guess that's due to them as a people. 2,000 years, you had families and communities working the rice party, getting about 4 o'clock in the morning, getting out there, and then calling it a day around 6 o'clock in the evening. So, And then when you look at China, for instance, I followed a situation in China they had one position that was open. They had 60,000 applicants, and then they just did it down, 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 until they came down to about 50 persons, and then one was finally selected after bringing it down to about 10. Plus, they have a tendency to pay a higher salary to civil servants. Now, one thing I would like to see when it comes to civil service, at the end of each year, I'd like to see them publish um, actual data. For instance, the number of sick days, a number of absences, the level of productivity, number of customers served, a number of applications processed. And I can always remember a story I heard uh, about a year or two ago. Late, um, we had about 10 ladies working in this particular quasi entity. Now, they are processing applications each day. The average person, the average lady, so 10 of them, 
yet nine of them processing anywhere from five to eight applications a day. She stood out and she was doing between 16 and 20, and varies from day to day, but 16 was her minimum and 20 was her max. And you know what they did? They turned around and said, well, this woman has to be up to something, and they launched an investigation. And I said, here it is, you had the other set who were incompetent, lazy, and dishonest, left them, let them reign and stay and let that incompetency the laziness and dishonesty set as the standard and mediocrity, and yet the high flyer, they want to punish them. Life just, boy, it's something. But anyhow, when you think of the, the um, Pension Act, it's the Statutes of the Bahamas, Chapter 43, Bahamas Pension Act. Now, civil servants and quasi-pensions, you must remember, they are non-contributory, meaning they don't put anything in. They put nothing into it, just show up to work and continue working and try to get the best service they can. Now, that's starting to change. You have some of the quasi entities are slowly but surely what they're doing is that they have persons put in five, up to 5% of their um, income, of their monthly pay, and then they match that 5%. So that's what's going on. And that's because in many cases, when you have a civil servant or quasi government person retire, Another person replaced them. After that person replaced them, you have a situation where that person is drawing a salary and then you have the other person who is retired drawing a pension. So you have two persons drawing salary for the same job, even though that other individual has retired. Now, full pension is with, when you get no lump sum, but you get your monthly payments and it's higher. Partial pension, this is after your, your 25 years, and after your 30 years, rather, for the average civil servant and 25 years for the, for the um, uniform branches, so after you would have put in your 35 years now, the partial pension is that you get a lump sum payment and then you get a, a monthly payment. And this is the one that I would advise because you don't know how long you're going to live. Now, for the retired government slash quasi employee, their possibility they can collect two pensions at, upon retirement because they can get their NIB pension, right? And then they can also get their treasury pension. So that's one thing. Let's look at the pension formula, how they go about calculating that. So if you up for pension, you could then listen to this and kind of figure it out or go to the pension act and online look at it or talk to somebody. Now, they take the years of service, you multiply that by 12 months so you could convert the years to months. Then you multiply that by the annual salary at retirement after you get all of that, you divide it by 720. I was driven crazy trying to figure out what the 720 was, but couldn't figure it out. But anyhow, um, and nobody could really tell me. And then the reduced pension, you would get 75% of that. Now, for persons who have 10 years of service, and they, for whatever reason, got to quit or leave or whatever you, they'll, they'll get what is known as a gratuity, and that's your years of service converted to months, of course, times 25%. And um, then, of course, you have the NIB pension, which is the full age pension, which is 65. And that's from the, if you've been making contributions through your employer or yourself. And then now uh, the NIB age for early pension, which is 80 percent, you get that at age 60. Of course, contract employees, they do not qualify for pensions. They get a 15 percent gratuity if they have two or more years of service now the permanent secretaries who are some vital people to this nation's well-being they receive two-thirds of the annual salary and they are the ones who advise and guide the electorate well we know the electorate can do what they want to do anyhow because whatever they think is in their interest but suffice it to be and um the thing is once you start getting pension pension payment are not adjustable for inflation so um if you got loans and all that before you before you hit retirement, you got to get rid of all of that. And then the idea is that um, that's up to government as time goes on to adjust it for inflation. Now, situations where you can apply for pension and still um, other than the normal 30 years or 25 years for the uniform branch, you could be injured on the job, you cannot continue working. Or you have an illness and you're unable to continue working. And so what they would do is what they call medically boarding. The doctor, have a doctor's report, put everything together, say, well, hey, this individual isn't able to continue doing that type of type of work, and if they don't have any other place, they can assign you. Now, in order to qualify for a lifetime pension through medically boarding, 
You must have five years or more of service. Now, the old age pension, that's um, non-contributory. That's persons who reach the age of 65, but have not been paying into national insurance through an employer or anything like that. Then, of course, you have the debt of pension or when the pensioner die. If that pensioner is your main support, you can apply for what they call an ex gratia. Um, you can condemn to, to the entity and they'll um, give you one year pension payout and then that can hopefully help you. Now to go about creating your own pension, which is the best way to go, find a way to start your own pension. Annuities is a good way and they are done mainly through insurance companies. What you do, sit down with your insurance company, agree to pay for 10, 15, 20, 25 or 30 years and you pay into them every month and then they're going to agree at the end of it just how much interest they're going to give you. And so your interest will be growing each month. It's almost like a savings account. But of course, they're managing your money and they are investing it and things of that sort. And at the end of it, you either can take a lump sum or monthly payment. And if you pass on, whoever is your beneficiary can then continue to collect that monthly payment until it all is used up. The second item is a personal savings. And that's where compound interest will work for you. Now, I normally suggest credit unions if you're going to do personal savings uh, account that you're not going to be going and dipping into. And of course, that's separate and apart from your rainy day fund or people call it your emergency saving. Then the other item is what I mentioned earlier, the employee matching um, program. So we have already talked about that. And then you have the banks and insurance. I mean, the banks have their private pension plan and they, they invest your money some of them in the stock market and some in bonds and different things. So you still have to keep a tab on, on that, so to speak. But these are some ways. Then another good way persons do is as they're making their way towards retirement. Sometimes they purchase a piece of land and decide that they, when I'm retired, I will sell that land and use that, to, that money to live on. Other persons build apartments or start a business. And then as, the, as they retire, they then transition into the business or they know, well, okay, I have the, the apartment to keep collecting a monthly income. Another thing to do is either you start learning a new skill or perfect a skill that you already have in preparation for retirement. Now, you must remember retirement isn't the end. It's a new chapter. Therefore, plan ahead of time. While in your 20s and your 30s and your 40s, whatever, it's never too late. Start your investment plan, be it annuities, be it savings, be it a business, whatever it is, start the preparation for that retirement. And here's one thing you need to do. Do not be a hoarder of information. Share, share, and share your knowledge. Remember now, the Burma Road riot and the majority rule wasn't necessarily about all the politics and all of that. That had stuff to do with it, but it was about opportunities that we have today. All this permanent and pensionability, all of that was wrapped up in it. Build your financial literacy. Spend less than you earn. Save systematically and build, and then watch your financial independence grow. And the last thing I would say is be a lifelong learner. Always be seeking new knowledge. Now, as I wrap up, I have a, had a tragic thing that happened just a day ago. Uh, my wife has a very, really good friend, and it was um, husband and wife team, Brent and Yulana, jo uh, Yul 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 Yulana yes, Johnson. And the thing is, um, you know, I think of him, and he was killed in an automobile accident and by an over overtaking drunk driver, ran into them head on. And the thing about life is that everything is collectively comes together based on your decision, and decisions are done in the second, in the minute, in the hour, in the day, the weeks, the months, and the years. Everything, it just keeps compounding and building upon each other. Then it shows that our lousiness as a nation when we've not come to the point on dealing with drunk drivers or people killing um, while being reckless with the driving. Persons like that has to be opted in terms of, hey, they should be um, vulnerable and to a life sentence and probably hanging if the case be because it's about idiotic actions and activity. But when I reflect on, on Brent, as I knew him, 
One thing I can always remember, here was a gentleman who was entrepreneurial in spirit. I can remember when he had the, one of the stores that out west somewhere, I think by Old Fort Bay, he had one of the BTC stores when cell phone and all that before BTC, I think, was sold and then Saturday or whatever it is. But he stopped that. And I remember when that finally closed after years of really being prosperous and, and, and it being very productive for him. It was, he took it in stride. This thing was Tony, hey, this life, things have changed. I just have to adjust with that. So he was, he, he was entrepreneurial, but he was practical and accepting to what they are and then moved on to the next item. But he had a very resilient spirit. And you know what I love most about him? He was not a hoarder. And here's what I mean when I say a hoarder. He was not an individual. If he learned something, he kept that to himself. No, he shared that because in sharing it, it impacted and helped somebody else, which would then in return come back to him, to him in another form. And the last thing I liked most about him was that he was one who knew how to laugh at himself. He sometimes cracked jokes about himself and some silly something that he would have done and things like that. So he had an entrepreneurial spirit, a very resilient spirit. He was not a hoarder of information. He could laugh at himself. Man, all I can say is that he now has his two daughters. Both he and his wife were killed. And he has his two daughters. One is in the ICU and the other one, well, is in regular ward. And doing, hopefully, we'll, they'll come through it all and continue to do well. But, you know, this is how life is. An idiot makes a decision and destroys everybody else's life. Boy, with no, with minimal um, consequences, maybe he'll pay one, five or ten thousand dollar fine and then walk free. Hopefully his conscience will um, bother him as he go forward. So until next time, may the God of heaven and his son, the Christ, bless and prosper you.